Well, suffice it to say that I'm extremely pleased uh, that this conference has been convened to take a comprehensive look at the waterfront and the various aspects of it and the future of it, which is uh, vital to our existence now and into to the future. Uh, today, we have a panel that's going to address uh, uh, the waterfront. Uh, I have a distinguished uh, group of gentlemen here who, <laughs> uh, just as a footnote, Chris Ward was supposed to be here, by the way, and Chris, after his eloquent, uh, after his eloquent uh, counsel of how difficult the task was, chose fit to, to grab me, who had to be uh, unfortunately standing close to him and said, yeah, he knows something about the waterfront. Chris walked out the door and put me up here, so uh, I'm not sure what exactly our mission is, but uh, I'm, I'm the mo moderator of it. So having said that, I look at across the table and I see, uh, I see a distinguished group, and uh, we're just going to jump right, right into it. You're uh, first? All righty. Let's go for it. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. That was kind of like, yeah, it was interesting. Chris, that, that, that unloading that grenade in the room and then saying, I got to go, bye. Uh, it's up to you people to figure out how to, how to work out these conflicts. Uh, I said to Bill Woods upstairs as we were coming in, I said, Bill, how does it feel to be a part of a mass movement after all these years? It's pretty interesting to, to see the level of interest and I think the sense of opportunity and the sense that that this is the moment uh, to uh, not just develop the plans but to move ahead and implement the plans that many of us have been been working on thinking about uh, imagining visioning and so forth for for a number of years uh, I'm president I'm Bob Yarrow I'm president of the regional plan association the way this is going to unfold I'm going to do a about a 20 minute presentation on the the, the uh, sweep and majesty of the Port of New York, the seaport of New York, and uh, past, present, and future, and the, and I'll be outlining the kinds of challenges that uh, that we need to wrestle to the ground, uh, you know, over the next uh, few years. If in fact the Port of New York is going to continue to be one of the engines of the region's economy, and if we're going to achieve the kinds of, of uh, common ground that everybody on the panel this morning was was discussing, the kind of balance between the between the uh, economic uh, values of the port. Uh, its environmental values, its its uh, its its value as an amenity to uh, uh, to the 23 million people who live in the metropolitan area. Uh, I'm president of Regional Plan Association. We've been involved since the 1920s in working uh, with the Port of, uh, Authority and with others. Uh, back in the 20s, uh, we had the audacious uh, uh, idea that uh, we ought to think about moving uh, what was then the seaport off the west side of Manhattan, the, the big shipping terminals and warehousing districts off the west side of Manhattan uh, to, uh, to, the, to other areas of the waterfront, principally uh, port, what became Port Newark and Port Elizabeth, uh, and, and, and then later Howland Hook and the other, and Global and the others uh, uh, that, that Jim manages. And, uh, and at the time it was, a, it was seen as a kind of outlandish idea. How could you even imagine moving the seaport off the west side waterfront? What would we do? with a west side waterfront that didn't have shipping and warehousing and stevedores and so forth and didn't have the Ilya Kazan view of on the waterfront that we saw 50 years ago. And the answer is, well, we've done pretty well. And uh, in, in, in creating you know, first the, the, the first modern container uh, terminal in, uh, terminals in the world, inventing that entire te technology, and then in holding our own as one of the leading uh, seaports in the United States, as you heard this morning, the third largest seaport in the United States, the largest seaport on the East Coast, uh, and, uh, and, and one of, the, one of America's uh, gateways to the global economy. The question before us now is whether we can sustain that role and whether we can achieve the kinds of accommodations that were discussed this morning uh, around, around dredging, around the conflicts between, between seaport activities and recreational and residential uses and public access and so forth and all the other issues that, uh, that, that Bill Woods and his colleagues in city planning and in city government are wrestling uh, with, with, with here and that the other agencies that were here this morning were, are, are, are a part of. Um, and the, the, the background, and I'll just put it out in front, is that, is that uh, uh, you know, for, for much of the last four centuries, you know, we, uh, we, we've been innovators. And it's interesting being in this building. This building is a monument to the prosperity of the Port of New York. As, as you know, the, the largest single revenue source for the United States government throughout, uh, throughout the uh, 19th century and right up until the time of the income tax was adopted in 1912, I guess it was, the biggest revenue source in, this, in, the, in the federal government was, was the Port of New York and the tariffs that were collected here from the shipping 
uh, that was coming into the Port of New York, the big, then the biggest port in the world. And this building really is, a, you know, is a monument to that to the to the wealth that that, that represented. Um, we've been innovators for 400 years. You know, New Amsterdam, the Dutch started this as a trading post. It's a shipping uh, a place and an entrepot. Uh, we, you know, we, if everything from the Erie Canal to the beginning of containerization to the, to the dredging of the Ambrose Channel, we've been innovators for 400 years. And that's allowed us to, to, to maintain the role of the, of the port of, of New York and New Jersey as one of the leading uh, seaports, one of the leading entrepots in the world. Now the question is whether we're going to continue to, 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 to keep that itch and to, to continue to innovate, continue to invest in the same way to maintain that. And the simple truth is that there are a bunch of other places up and down the East Coast who would like very much to clean our clocks. Uh, and the big opportunity, as Chris Ward and others mentioned this morning, and the challenge, the, the threat, is the widening of the Panama Canal, which is going to allow a new generation of even larger uh, super post Panamax ships, and I'll have some images of just how big they are. Uh, uh, they're going to be coming through the canal. A lot of the shipping that currently goes into the Port of Los Angeles and then comes across the country in a very uh, uh, congested railroad system to the East Coast, increasingly congested system, a lot of that shipping is going to come through a widened and deepened uh, Panama Canal to East Coast ports. And the question is whether that activity is going to come to the Port of New York. For that to happen, we need to do some things here, and that means including uh, dredging to 50-foot channels in much of the harbor, uh, uh, at, at some point in the future, uh, uh, getting additional clearance under the Bayonne Bridge and other activities uh, that, uh, that will allow uh, us to capitalize on that opportunity. If we don't, uh, there are these other places, Norfolk, Baltimore, Newport News, and others who would like very much to take that business uh, away from us. And I'll go into in a moment just how important the seaport is as an economic activity, as a, as a labor source, and so forth. Um, we've started uh, 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 recently uh, to work with the Port Authority on a, on a, on a shared uh, look at the future of the ports. And you know, RPA was founded in 1922. The Port Authority was founded in 1921. I guess we were founded in a way to, to, to be a, a nudge for the port and to kind of push them along. and, and uh, uh, and, and occasionally partner with them, occasionally cr critique them. I think Roland uh, said it really very clearly, you know, we'll be their best friends at some points and then we'll be in the next day saying you've got to do the following things. But we're working with them on uh, to, to, to take a, sh a shared look at the future of the ports, uh, what the seaport uh, should be, how to balance the economic, environmental, and community interests around the port, uh, what the challenges are and what actions are going to be needed um, uh, by all of the public and private entities that are represented in the room today and on the panel this morning, uh, the, all of us have a stake in the, in the, in the success of the, of the port. Let's see what happens here. Nothing happens. Uh, okay, there we go. Okay, not a new story. You know, the past and the future of the port and the, and the city's economy, the region's economy, are inexorably intertwined. Uh, the port uh, is really the raison d'etre for, for New York City's existence as, uh, as, a, as a great city, as a world city, and the regions developed around the port and the waterfront activities that shaped its early economy. And as I mentioned earlier, in each era, going back uh, to f 400 years to the point, point where the, the, the original settlement in New Amsterdam was here, you know, we've reconfigured the shoreline, we've constructed piers to accommodate the latest generation of shipping. Uh, we built the Erie Canal, we, uh, uh, we gave the harbor a unique competitive advantage in the early 19th century that really secured New York's place uh, in competition with Philadelphia and Boston and other East Coast ports as New York's national city and its principal gateway. Uh, the deepening and straightening of the Ambrose Channel in the early 20th century provided for a new generation of very large uh, steamships to, to both, both passenger and cargo ships to make it into New York and, and again secured our place in the early 20th century. And then finally, as I mentioned earlier, the Port of New York and New Jersey pioneered the use of containers to transport container uh, cargo in the early post-war period. So we've been innovators for 400 years, and it really is uh, going to be uh, for us to succeed in the future. We're going to have to continue to, 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 to have that, that cutting edge. There we go. Um, but as, as trade and industrialization in the region grew, so did the, so did the port. These are the, these are the uh, areas of the port on both sides of the harbor, Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island, uh, Bayonne and, and so forth uh, in, in 1949, the immediate uh, post-war period. Um, and uh, and uh, it, most of the port, as was discussed this morning, most of the waterfront was occupied by, by port facilities in 1949. 
the port today is a very different uh, place. Um, between World War II and today, there, there have been dramatic changes in the footprint of the port. Much of the waterfront that was, was occupied a half century ago by port facilities is now available for the parks and, water and, and uh, public access and the residential and commercial development that, we, uh, that, that was discussed this morning. And that a big part of the conferences and, the, and of, of the new plan for the waterfront is about how to, how to uh, continue to, uh, to, to create those opportunities on former uh, seaport uh, properties. Uh, so containerization required the consolidation of the industry in larger contiguous tracts of land for, for, for yards to create new container facilities, mostly in Newark, Elizabeth, Staten Island, and Bayonne with only the Red Hook and Sunset Park uh, waterfronts remaining along the Brooklyn and Queens waterfront as part of the, part of the port. The punchline here, as you can see in these two, two maps, is that, the, is that today's seaport handles much more cargo, much more efficiently on much less land, creating the opportunities for the kinds of diverse new uses that, that are being discussed at the conference today. Um, so uh, the, uh, the port today, if you haven't been down to see it, is a very different place than, than the image in, on the waterfront uh, 50 years ago. You know, it's probably a little less colorful, no Marlon Brandos and things. Um, uh, but we've got a new set of, comp a new set of co competitive uses for the port, and this is really what the heart of this discussion is about, about today. Port activities are competing with evolving residential uh, and recreational and other industrial uses, as well as with the natural habitat and, in, and, uh, uh, and wetlands and other uh, uh, elements of the natural systems in the harbor. Uh, making port development a very complicated balancing act of different economic and environmental objectives, really the heart of Chris Ward's comment this morning. The port of New York and New Jersey is a national as well as a regional asset. Uh, as I guess uh, I've said and others have said, it's, you know, it's our principal Atlantic uh, uh, at gateway and it's a key node in the national intermodal goods uh, distribution uh, network. And as I, I guess a couple of speakers mentioned this morning, it's also the most environmentally uh, uh, efficient uh, and, and, and ben beneficial way of moving, moving, moving goods. It's just a lot, lot uh, less energy intensive uh, and polluting to move uh, goods in and out of, of the Port of New York by ship than it is to move it move by trucks or even by rail or by air, certainly. Um, the port, as others have mentioned, is, uh, is more important than ever as a source of employment for blue collar jobs. Uh, in an era of declining manufacturing, goods distribution is one of the few sectors with the potential to grow the number of well-paying jobs that don't require a college degree. Uh, nationally, from 1993 to 2008, that's what this, this slide shows, uh, freight and transportation, the, the, the logistics industry in this country added 2 million jobs at a time when manufacturing, uh, the manufacturing sector lost 3 million jobs. And over the same period, 15-year period, 1993 to 2008, the number of jobs in this region involved in, in, in port-related activities increased by over 100,000 or 62 percent. Uh, Good paying uh, jobs for people who might have been in manufacturing uh, a generation or more ago. Now, who benefits from all of this? And the answer is that we all do. Most of the cargo that comes in through the port is used by consumers and businesses in the region. All of us depend on uh, on these cargoes to, for our daily lives and, and, and so forth. Without the port, costs of, of getting goods into and out of, the, out of the region would increase and more goods would need to be shipped in, in by truck from other ports. And as you heard this morning from the round of applause every time somebody mentioned the number of trucks taken over bridges, this is a very big deal in a, in a region where the major highways and, and uh, bridge and tunnel crossings are just gridlocked with, uh, with, with truck traffic and where the impact of trucks on neighborhoods and, and, and residential areas is, is uh, bigger than it's ever been. Uh, the, 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 um, the numbers you know, are, are enormous, about 5.3 million TEUs, these 20-foot equivalent units, the basic unit of, of containers, uh, and $190 billion in, in value um, every year. And of course, there are a set of related maritime support uses that where a lot of the conflicts between industrial and residential and, and, and recreational activity on the port, uh, uh, you know, are, where those conflicts are occurring. And it's those related maritime support services, the barge repair operations, the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the tugboat operations and, and, and other activities, dry docks and other activities that are part of the ecology, of the industrial ecology of the port that have to be sustained if we want to maintain the the, uh, the container uh, operations in the port, the bulk cargoes in the port. 
Uh, the port's been growing. We've had a rough couple of years since 2008, but we've had consistent and, and, and rapid growth in both uh, principally on the import side, but now in increasingly on the export side. And as the U.S. finally gets around to creating a uh, uh, recreating a manufacturing economy, having the ability to, to, to export uh, goods through the port is going to be more important than ever. Growth has resumed in 2010, it's resumed this year, but can be expected to continue on an upward trajectory, perhaps not as, uh, as fast as the rate of the past 15 years. Um, now here's the challenge. Uh, uh, this, this is a ship going through the Panama Canal. With the widening and deepening of the canal scheduled for completion in 2014, it could fundamentally change the dynamics of of global, global shipping patterns and shipping routes with the potential to bring even more cargo directly to the East Coast instead of going into, into Los Angeles. And these are the long-term forecasts that we're, uh, that we're looking at, which show the Port of New York, New Jersey, uh, uh, you know, essentially uh, uh, f uh, uh, some pretty fundamental changes uh, by 2015 with the increase in, in, in trade from Asia going directly uh, to the Port of New York via the Panama Canal. And, and a declining share of our uh, of our port coming from transatlantic trade. And the interesting thing is the is the green area. The amount of as as the uh, manufacturing economy. Oh, sorry. Uh, there you go. Got ahead of me. Um, uh, it, the the green the, the green bars here, it, which basically show the uh, increase in in Suez Canal trade. And as as the manufacturing economy in Asia shifts from uh, southern China. Uh, to Indonesia, to India, and other uh, Vietnam and other South Asian ports, we could probably see that green section of the Suez Canal trade increasing as well. Uh, and this gives you a sense of just you know how big these ships have become and are likely to become in the future. And you know the size of the new uh, uh, post Panamax and, and super Panamax ships and so forth. Uh, compared to the Empire State Building, they're really uh, quite large, and this is the challenge of getting them into uh, into this this harbor that the rest of us also use for other activities. Uh, as the uh, Colonel mentioned this morning, we've got these uh, depth constraints. Uh, the natural depth of much of the harbor is about 15 to 20 feet, and uh, and so maintenance dredging is is required to keep these channels open. And we have this additional challenge of deepening from about 42 feet today in the main shipping channels to 50 feet to accommodate the post Panamax shipping. And you heard from Peter Davidson the challenges in permitting and in disposal of taking these dredge spoils, some of them contaminated, most of them not, and using them uh, for beneficial use uh, and, and, and getting them you know, out of the shipping channels in, a, in an efficient way. And here we're really uh, uh, competing uh, and we're at a disadvantage with places like Norfolk where the United States Navy uh, maintains shipping channels for the port of Norfolk where the state, of, the state of Virginia has built at its own expense a set of containment islands for dredge uh, disposal materials, and they're paying a tiny fraction of what we're paying to maintain uh, channel depths and to deepen, uh, deepen the channels. And of course, those of you that are watching Jim DeMint squirm, and you know, over the, over the, it's been kind of fun watching him squirm over the uh, proposed deepening of the, of the Port of Charleston and what requires a congressional earmark, but same issue for Charleston that we're facing here. We have height constraints, that the newest generation of, of, of very large ships coming through a widened uh, Panama Canal will also be higher, and, uh, the, and many of them will not be able to make it under the Bayonne Bridge. They, 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 the bridge needs to be about 10 feet higher uh, than, it, than it is now. Many of you saw earlier in the year that, uh, that Governor Christie had proposed and it wants to move ahead with a, with a raising of the Bayonne Bridge, a very expensive uh, project. But if we're going to have the next generation of very large ships getting into Port Elizabeth and Port Newark and, 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 uh, and Howland Hook, this is going to become a, uh, a, a, an urgent uh, matter, not immediately, but at some point in the not too distant future. And of course, it takes time to, to, uh, uh, to move ahead with these things. Um, um, okay, so the question is, how do we create a sustainable port, one that's sustainable in every way? And I would argue that there are six components. You know, one is that we is is this idea of resource efficiency that we need to maximize the use of existing facilities. We need to be as efficient in the way we use them as, as possible. Uh, that that um, that labor and facility productivity needs to be uh, uh, as high as it can be and higher than it is now. And we're more productive than most U.S. ports, but not as productive as 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 some. And we need to do, to do better. Financial sustainability. We need to find a way to to over over time to finance. Uh, needed investments in dredging and port facilities uh, and so forth for, for what could, it, could in the future be a larger, uh, a larger port and should be a larger port. 
uh, sorry, uh, environmental sustainability. Uh, we, we need to balance the needs of the port, dredging, and, and, uh, and, uh, and container facilities against the need to protect and restore wetlands. We've been dealing with this at Howland Hook. This issue is going to be going to continue to come up. It's one of the, I think, big conflicts that Chris was referring to in his closing remarks this, uh, this morning. Uh, and we need to find ways to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and improve air quality. Of course, first thing, uh, keep, keep shipping on ships and not on trucks would be a good way to deal with air quality. But, but ships need to be, uh, need to be cleaner than, than they are now, and there are ways of doing that. Uh, safety and security, we need to focus on worker safety and improving screening for explosives and other, other things that might come into the port. And then finally, uh, you know, what I refer to here as healthy communities, finding the balance between, between the, the, the needs of a growing seaport and the, and the, uh, and the need to minimize environmental risks and, and sustain and improve air quality and other aspects of the residential communities that the, uh, and the people who live in and around uh, the, the Port of New York. So six aspects to a sustainable port that we need to, uh, to aspire to. Um, uh, the first of these, you know, thinking about port land utilization, um, you know, where, uh, you know, how do we measure the efficiency of, and effectiveness of port operations? You know, we're one of the most efficient uh, uh, ports in the country uh, in terms of our utilization uh, of existing seaports, some, something like 80% or 70, 75% of the capacity is being used now. Um, uh, but other measures such as cost per container are more difficult to come by, and we seem to be at a disadvantage because of the regions uh, and the port, the port of New York's you know, high costs, particularly labor costs. Unlike many other around the clock industries, longshoremen on the East Coast don't, uh, do not work in shifts. Instead, whole relief crews are on hand throughout uh, loading and unloading of ships. Because it was the first to containerize the New York, New Jersey port retains some labor, uh, legacy labor costs that, that competitor ports don't have. Uh, extra staffing requirements, different benefit structure, and so forth than the places that we're competing with up and down the East Coast. All right, this thing goes, likes to go two at a time here. Let's try this. Um, um, so in thinking about new capacity for, the, for a growing post-Panamax, uh, you know, a, a post-Panama Canal widening port, you know, how can we proceed to uh, uh, create this new capacity? And I would describe it as it, it, it being a three, three three phases. For short term, we need to work within the existing footprint of the port uh, through operational changes, labor changes, relocation of some existing uses that don't need to be on port facilities and so forth to improve the efficiency of the existing facilities. In the midterm, we need to, uh, to think about planned expansions of existing uh, terminal facilities such as Howland Hook into Port Ivory, which is shown here in the upper left-hand corner, the, the modest expansion that is underway at, uh, uh, at, at Howland Hook. Uh, New York Container Terminal, and then and the same thing at the Global Marine Terminal in Bayonne, which are which is in the process of, of creating new berths and expanding. Longer term, we may need new container uh, facilities, and we need to we need to to essentially uh, land bank or not create conflicting uses uh, in Motby, which is shown here on the lower right hand side in Bayonne, or in Sunset Park. That we need to to have the option of expanding into these uh, these new areas in the future, uh, if and when that capacity is going to be needed. Uh, expansions and new development are going to require the, the sensitive balancing that has been discussed here and that Chris Ward mentioned between economic, environmental, and community needs. For example, the Port Ivory expansion uh, needs to be done in a way that's good for the port but also good for the adjoining Arlington Marsh and the natural systems that it represents. Let's see. There we go. Um, we have a challenge in getting goods uh, once they've gotten to the port and getting them out of the port. And of course, the, the, the issue that Congressman Nadler keeps raising of, of getting goods across the, 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 the harbor and across the Hudson River is one of our biggest challenges. This map shows the forecast uh, for increased highway congestion, and the red areas show the places that are going to be at or near or beyond capacity by 2035. And if you've been on the GW Bridge recently, you know we're there now. But existing port uh, access constraints and the distribution challenges are going to worsen. Um, so we need to be uh, uh, taking some extraordinary steps to improve cross-harbor goods, uh, goods movement. Uh, Peter Davidson mentioned this morning some of the options that are being considered now for the, for the, for the, uh, for the food mart in the South Bronx and, and for other facilities. And the cross-harbor EIS study that uh, Congressman Nadler you know, has, has instigated, the Port Authority's leading, is, uh, creates the opportunity for all of us to finally address the lack of rail access across the harbor. Uh, uh, 
uh, David Bragg did mention the challenges of sea level rise, but even more important is the, the more immediate challenges of, of storm surges. We're going to have a, uh, you know, a nor'easter uh, tomorrow, I guess, that will that will create a modest storm surge. And we know from the experience, what almost 20 years ago with a nor'easter that flooded the uh, the path of portals in New Jersey, that that even a, a modest increase or a, a storm surge can create uh, havoc with these critical facilities, seaport facilities included, and they're shown in, uh, they're highlighted here, but you can see even a very modest storm surge puts a lot of our uh, working waterfront and our container operations uh, underwater. Uh, some of our competitors in, in places like Norfolk or, or Rotterdam are actually planning for uh, modernization of their ports and elevating the seaport and container port facilities. And we'll need to, to uh, you know, as climate uh, change and sea level rise accelerate and the incidence of serious uh, storms uh, increases, this is going to become an even more pertinent uh, and immediate concern. Let's see. Okay. Um, again, other ports are making investments and developing strategies to address new opportunities and, and challenges. This is an image of Singapore, which is, you know, creating a very super efficient, you know, 21st century port. Um, this is Rotterdam. You can tell Holland because there are windmills in the picture, but this is what they're doing. You know, in the Dutch, it's really quite extraordinary to see their new seaport. You know, they, the, the little niceties of, you know, filling land and dredge spoils disposal. Well, the Dutch just consider that to be a part of life. And they, the new Europe port extends, I don't know, it's 15 miles or something out into the North Sea to create the super large um, uh, berths and depths and so forth that are needed for, uh, for Rotterdam to remain the preeminent port in Western Europe. You know, our competitors around the world are making the, these investments, and we really do need to keep an eye on the competition. Uh, this is the port of Long Beach, which again is moving ahead with a, you know, with a very aggressive uh, strategy to expand the port. And then, most importantly, the you know the, the port of Los Angeles has built the Alameda corridor, which gets both truck and rail traffic in in and out of the port, uh, with a, and minimizes the impacts on the adjoining uh, residential uh, communities. So, some closing comments. Um, and I know this is the beginning of a dialogue, and we're going to hear from our panelists now to get their thoughts on these on these issues. Uh, I don't believe that we can accept the idea of a shrinking port, that, that in fact, given the competition uh, that we're facing uh, more than ever from, from places like Norfolk and Newport, New, Newport News and Baltimore and, and Charleston and so forth, uh, that, uh, that we need to be more efficient than ever and we need to be thinking about a port that's uh, growing and continuing to sustain this important sector of the region's economy. As I mentioned earlier, it's our raison d'etre here in New York. It's, it continues to be you know, one of the bedrock uh, foundations for, for the regional economy. And, uh, and, and avoiding uh, these issues or not achieving the kind of consensus that's going to be needed to move ahead uh, with, uh, with harbor deepening and with the expansion of the port uh, puts, puts this uh, very big sector of our economy um, and, and the hundreds of thousands of people who depend on it for direct employment and 23 million people who depend on the goods and so forth that are coming through the port, the port puts all of that at risk. Um, it will con this port will continue to be the region's primary gateway to the to global markets, um, and where it served to export raw materials and manufactured goods in the past. Today, it imports most of the products that all of us uh, consume on a daily basis. Uh, and the key, I think, is going to be innovation and maintaining our cutting edge. Going back to this tradition that that started with uh, the the Erie uh, Canal and the Ambrose Channel and 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 the the invention of containerization and so forth, that, that uh, we need to be on the cutting edge of the next generation of, of, of technological improvements and economic efficiency in, uh, in the development of our port. We can't uh, allow ourselves to become a second-rate uh, uh, seaport. We know that there are trade-offs. We need to find the balance with these other, other needs that are being uh, discussed and are going to be dealt with in the city's plan. And, uh, and, uh, but, but we can't uh, 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 allow events just to take their course. We need to be aggressive about making sure that the, the, the port in the 21st century is as successful uh, as the port has been for 400 years. Thank you. Robert, that was an ac excellent job. Uh, clearly uh, captured virtually everything that I could possibly conceive of that we need to think about in terms of protecting our, our uh, valuable resource, i.e. the working waterfront going forward. Uh, very well done. Thank you. Um, I will uh, just make one minor connection or one minor correction to one of the comments I saw Andrew uh, looked up and start when he said uh, that New York Container Terminal was in fact already expanding uh, on berth four. That is incorrect decidedly incorrect. Uh, the 
clearly the, the challenges that uh, Chris alluded to are still unmet and uh, still need to be resolved, but uh, that, uh, other than that one minor uh, issue of uh, uh, unfortunately stating that we were on the construction, uh, nicely done. At this point in time, I'd like to introduce our next panelist, Joe Curdo. Joe Curdo is a denizen of the harbor for 30 plus years. Uh, I have the pleasure of knowing Joe uh, in various capacities over all these years. Uh, Joe currently is the president of uh, New York Sh Shipping Association. Prior to this assignment, he was the chief operating individual for MAR Container Terminals, the largest operator in the port. And Joe uh, has seen much of the evolution that's happened in the last 30 years, and I'm sure he's going to enlighten us now with his presentation. Please welcome Joe Curdo. Jim. I think I'll just stay here, if it's okay. Um, I'm just going to pick up the ball that uh, Jim Devine usually carries and talk a little bit about history. Bob started his history lesson by talking about the migration of business from the west side of New York to new facilities on the uh, New Jersey side of the harbor. I just want to take a minute to go back a little further, and, and Bob actually did, uh, did touch on this. As you look around the city, and all that is here, it's sometimes easy to forget that all that is here in what's called the capital of the world came about because of trade. From Henry Hudson to Verrazano to the Portuguese navigators, Dutch settlers that we talked about, British colonists, privateers, clipper ships, steamships to uh, today's modern ships, the history of New York is tied to trade. As Bob mentioned earlier, we're sitting in the U.S. Customs House. Around the corner is uh, South Street Seaport. Across the street is One Broadway, and a little further down is 17 Battery Place, two very famous uh, maritime addresses. Wall Street and the whole financial center had their roots in trade. There were and are still the West Side Piers, the East Side, Brooklyn, Erie Basin, the Brooklyn Navy Yard, uh, the Army uh, Terminal in, in Brooklyn, the, the BAT, and the list just goes on and on. So there's no question that uh, New York has a strong maritime history, and as uh, Seth Pinsky pointed out earlier, out earlier, there are some 270,000 people that are employed on an annual basis, directly, indirectly, or through induced jobs uh, in port activities. I think that we need to protect everything that we have today and grow what we have today. This has been touched on before, too. With limited exception, we're talking a little bit about the Staten Island and the development of Berth 4 and the slide you saw of uh, Motby. There's very little other land that can be um, reclaimed for big container terminals. We're not going to start redeveloping the uh, existing waterfront with new vast acreages of container terminals. So that means we have to get more out of what we got. We have to get more efficient at what we do. We have to use our facilities better. And there are a lot of challenges, and, and Bob didn't go into detail, but he did touch on things like uh, productivity. And Manning here in the Port of New York, our, our relief system is somewhat different than other ports. And we talked a little bit about um, Benefit costs. The benefit costs are higher here, drives the cost of doing business up here. And I think one of the last slides talked about uh, development of intermodal rail facilities. Um, today, some 85% of all the cargo that moves in and out of our marine terminals still moves by truck. We really need to get more of that cargo moving by rail or short haul rail or by water. Um, there wasn't a lot talked about in uh, Bob's presentation about using the water, but I think we have to take a real hard look at how we're going to use the water to move people, decongest our highways, and to use the water to move some of the cargo around to get them, get the trucks off the uh, roadways. I think anybody that uh, has tried to drive over the George Washington Bridge at rush hour knows what I'm talking about. So we have a lot of challenges. We need to work on things. We, the terminal operators, need to work on things like velocity. We have to get the cargo moving off the terminals quicker so we can bring more, more cargo on. We do need to improve our productivity, which does lag behind uh, that at other ports. And we, used to need, we need to use technology to its fullest extent to help us become more efficient. 
Um, so with those few comments, I'm going to uh, give up the microphone. I anticipate there'll be some questions later that I can talk to and opine to, but I want to give my other two panelists a chance to talk. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Um, there, there's always two sides to a coin. Uh, clearly, even as we seek to improve the efficiency of the ports, we also seek in some ways to expand them, witness what we've talked about earlier today. But there is a counterbalance to that, and that is the environment and the importance of the environment. Uh, my daughter uh, uh, has uh, uh, been working in the environmental science field for a no number of years. She's currently in Maine with the Maine Coast Heritage Trust. And I love her uh, statement to me uh, in terms of the environment and why sh we should be thinking of it. Uh, her comment is frequently that the, the most endangered species on the planet today is man. If we don't properly look at what we're doing to our planet, then we're, we're basically cutting off our own oxygen supply, perhaps not on a near-term basis, but clearly in a long-term basis. So we do need to look at the our plans um, through that prism occasionally, and there's no one better to uh, take take that position than Andrew Wilner, who uh, will be our next uh, p panelist. Please. Thank you. Uh, so um, I have to begin by saying I'm a working waterfront advocate and have been through my career. I actually began my work on the waterfront as a boat builder in Staten Island. But I, I guess I'm the the uh, panel contrarian as well. I think we have to accept the idea that in the future we're going to have to have a smaller, more efficient, and a sustainable port for these reasons. The New York port is not isolated from the economy or the environment of the region or the world. A true 21st century port will have to answer many of the same questions with which the rest of the world is belatedly, belatedly beginning to grapple. The New York-New Jersey port will have to take a more realistic view about the relationship between the economy and the environment as it plans for its future. More than ever before, we need elected and appointed officials and leaders who can conceive of a larger vision. We need advisors to, the, to government like the Regional Plan Association to be economists and planners who think more like ecologists. Planning for a 21st century poor will have to take into account global climate change, peak oil, and the external cost of a fossil fuel dependent shipping and logistics system. The shipping industry today contributes about 4 to 6 percent of high particulate atmospheric carbon, about the same amount that's discharged by either Canada or Germany. It's a significant amount. The Port of New York cannot plan for its future in isolation. It is literally the tie that binds us to the rest of the world, and its future is to reflect the reality of a world in which business as usual is, of course, to, to disaster. The Port has to use its bully pulp and its significant economic and political clout to ensure that planning includes not just participation in, but a commitment to a more comprehensive plan, one that is global in its aspect, uh, one that's similar to Lester Brown's Plan 4.0, mobilizing to save civilization. That plan includes, but is not limited to, cutting carbon emissions by 80 percent by 2020, and restoring the Earth's natural systems, including its soils, aquifers, forests, grasslands, and fisheries. The past and the future of the port's region and economy are inexorably entwined. So that being said, and I don't know we don't have very much time to talk, one of my, I guess my pet peeves over the years has been the idea that New York must be the largest port on the East Coast, that it must be competitive with other East Coast ports, instead of thinking about how it can become a more efficient, more competitive place that doesn't have to build it and they will come like other ports on the East Coast are doing. Raising the Bayonne Bridge is about the silliest idea I've ever heard in my life. The, um, the costs nationally in terms of benefits and costs comes nowhere near equity, which means that in terms of local benefit and costs, it's way skewed towards the cost side. So there's no real benefit to anybody in the port to raise the Bayonne Bridge. We could spend those billions of dollars improving the port at Motby in Brooklyn at Global, reinvigorating our rail service and reinvigorating the Cross Harbor float. Thanks. Thank you, Andrew. 
Uh, clearly, that's going to engender some uh, brisk debate from nobody else, at least from me. Um, but with that thought in mind, uh, it might be appropriate now to just reflect on what's going to happen after Manju speaks, because what we do want to do is entertain questions. So you might take a minute and just uh, write down any questions that you would like to uh, bring, bring to our attention, which might be the catalyst for uh, some uh, very, uh, hopefully, uh, worthwhile productions. Our next, uh, our next speaker is, uh, is uh, well known to me. I, he worked with, with the project that we've got over at New York Container Terminal on the, on the expansion of that facility. Uh, he's well versed in not only with the greater New York Harbor, but the greater industry around the world. And it's my pleasure to bring Manju from Halcro to, to the stand, or if he would like to sit and make his comments at this point in time. Go for yeah, it. Yeah, I'll, um, um, I'll react to some of the things that, uh, that have been said earlier. And um, I think I'll take the mantle of panel contrarian, because that's what Chris wanted me to do. But, uh, <laughs> um, and I will look at it from a global perspective. I think one of the things, you know, there were slides thrown up of Singapore and Rotterdam, and, um, you know, um, uh, no offense, Jim or, or Joe, but I'm kind of a little tired of hearing the history lessons, at least as far as the ideal ex leaving from Newark, et cetera. And to your comment, Bob, you know, you use the um, past tense to say that we have been innovators, and I think that we've lost the edge in the last 15 years or so if you look at what's going on on the global front. Um, if you look at, um, you know, one of the comments uh, that Andrew just made about size is not important. Um, I took a delegation from the Panama Canal uh, Authority around the world about 12 months ago, and I took them to Rotterdam, Singapore, and Hong Kong. The notion was that with the expansion of the Panama Canal, you know, we're going to have all this traffic going by. How do we leverage it and create opportunities for ourselves? So they wanted to actually go to the places that they perceived as being, you know, the centers of excellence or where best practices are and learn from these uh, particular ports. Um, let me tell you that in Rotterdam, they don't care anymore about topping the league tables in the Hamburg, Le Havre range. They say, we don't care if we're number one or we have, you know, if we handle 10 million TUs when Hamburg handles nine. They're much more interested in being the most efficient and cost-effective gateway of goods into Europe. That's the actual metric that they use. Um, <clears throat> similarly, again, with Rotterdam, we're using a model of, you know, 1960s and 70s metrics to measure the future of the port. I mean, I understand that you want to look back for, backward to look forward. I'm a big proponent of that, but, you know, people in Europe and in Singapore are no longer talking about jobs and taxes, and we continue to talk about this economic development model that is already way too old for looking into the future. People mention the global competitiveness that people in Singapore, in Asia, manufacturing, etc. Um, there was mention of the blue-collar jobs growing by 62 percent. Why did that actually happen? Well, because cargo volumes grew, but productivity didn't grow in line. Productivity stayed stagnant is what I would probably argue. And so therefore, if the cargo volumes grew by a significant number, then the jobs also grew. Uh, what we need to do, again, you take, take Singapore as an example, um, they are not looking at input-output modeling anymore to measure the impact of the port. They're looking at actual value added in terms of jobs created, but on the higher end of the value chain. They're not looking to see whether more cargo and more containers means more jobs on the waterfront. They're saying we want higher paying jobs with a better value added and then therefore a better knock-on effect in a broader spectrum of the economy. So <clears throat> again, um, you know, I'm using the hyperbole to make my point, but they don't really care about the direct impact. And you know, we talk about 250,000 jobs. Um, again, talking to the people in Rotterdam, they said, well, you know, you can take this economic modeling to an extreme. They actually reverse engineered the models that they were using and said, well, if we are actually to believe the model that we have been using historically, then if you took the port of Rotterdam, this was basically what these guys said, if you took the port of Rotterdam out of Holland, okay, and you just said its economic activity was zero, then apparently 80% of the Dutch economy would collapse. Now, 
I don't think that anybody here would believe that 80% of the Dutch economy would collapse. So the questions that, you know, that really come into my mind are, we talk about innovation, efficiency, et cetera. Yes, you know, we've, we've come a long way, but there's still a long way to go. And I think, you know, it's, Chris talked about conflicts and there are some very hard questions that need to be asked and answered. And I don't know how we're gonna do that. I'll talk about the work stoppage a couple of, was it last week or week before last year? Um, when, um, when, uh, when the work stoppage occurred on the, on the West Coast a number of years ago, several supply chain managers actually brought their cargo to East Coast ports because they perceived the East Coast labor situation as being more stable. Um, now with this unrest, um, you know, what's that gonna do? Supply chain managers are getting nervous again. And I think the other notion here is that the Panama Canal will certainly open up new routes, but I don't think that any of us should delude ourselves that the West Coast ports are not gonna put up a fight to get all that cargo um, that you know, they are supposedly going to lose. Um, the Port of New York or Norfolk, for that matter, does not have a monopoly on getting cargo to the Midwest. Um, I'll go back to 1995, and this is my brief history lesson, but um, in 1995, uh, CN actually hooked up with Illinois Central to you know, get cargo through West Coast ports in Canada into the Midwest. So there are a multitude of options, and cargo will take the path of least resistance, either in terms of costs or in terms of efficiency, and the, the two are interrelated. So. I've kind of thrown a lot of stuff out there, but I'm really trying to provoke a little bit of a debate here because we seem to be dancing around the handbag, as we say in England. So with that, I'll, <laughs> I'll, <laughs> I'll stop there. Thank you, Manju. Um, clearly, uh, there is some different views of what the future should look like. That is, uh, that is the mission of this discussion today. Um, and uh, why, don't, why don't we open up the floor to any questions that you might have of the panelists or for that matter, observations that you would like to uh, make. We have a microphone that's available and uh, if you'd like to just raise your hand and someone will come with a mic, please. Hello, uh, my name is Anna Baptista and uh, I'm a member of the Healthy Ports Coalition and a resident of the uh, Ironbound community, which is a port adjacent community. Uh, near Port Newark and Elizabeth. And uh, I haven't heard, although I've heard, you know, the nice listing of um, in issues of importance around <coughs> growing the port, um, where is the substance in terms of the real felt impacts of the environmental burdens on port adjacent communities? Um, in sharp contrast to, you know, we keep hearing about the economic engine in our backyard. Newark has the highest unemployment rate um, and, and some of the highest in the country. So we are seeing little of the economic benefit, or if we're seeing it, we're seeing it in very low paid, low quality jobs like port trucking. And, uh, you know, what's the Port Authority doing about making real investments in port adjacent communities and in making an investment in the broken trucking system, which impacts our communities with uh, diesel pollution and clogs up our highways. Uh, you know, are we looking at models like Rotterdam in LA, like the clean truck, truck program that brings, you know, better paid jobs and clean air to, to port adjacent communities? Um, I, I think I'll try and uh, answer part of that because I am very familiar with the Port Authority's initiatives regarding the clean truck program. They have been engaged in that activity now for a multitude of years. They do have Bill Nerthen. I don't think he's w with us in the, in the room today but they have uh, assigned an organization or a component of the Port Authority to address uh, clean trucking specifically. There is an initiative that actually kicks off in a, about a month, the 1st of January. There's a ban on certain series of trucks that will no longer be allowed to come into the harbor. It's pre-1994. There's a sticker system that's going to uh, be policed by the Port Authority police to prevent those trucks from being part of the port community going forward. And they are increasing that, uh, that threshold as we go forward. Uh, there's an active program that the Port Authority is financing in terms of creating RFID tags. Uh, these are the radio transmitter tags which will improve the efficiency of, uh, of registering trucks into the clean truck program as well as improve 
over time the efficiency of the terminals in trying to uh, effectively schedule trucks into and out of their facilities so we, so we can uh, do away with some of the truck lines which are part of the pollution. So the Port Authority is keenly aware of those concerns and uh, I think they're working aggressively to make that part of it. The, the Port Authority also, I, I know very factually, that the Port Authority in the recent uh, global terminal uh, expansion program has uh, bedded in the lease the requirement to look at uh, green uh, energy, uh, look at wind turbines. So the Port Authority takes seriously their, their, uh, their, their uh, responsibility to help clean up the harbor. Question. Hi, my name is Mike Krieger. Uh, early in my career, I worked for, uh, for a group called Long Range Planning in the aviation business. And uh, there's an area off of uh, Long Beach near uh, JFK uh, in the water that's relatively shallow. I've read in the past uh, of private uh, interest trying to use that as a site perhaps to accommodate dredge materials and then maybe build uh, a solar a solar or a wind or ocean energy uh, 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 island. But I wanted to make a statement because I did spend a lot of my career at the Port Authority in long range planning and the planning and development and waterfront development. All of us in the room, and I speak not just to the members on the panel, we have to face the following reality. And that is to make the future better, you have to change the assumptions on which future forecasts are made. And the way to do that is by institutional structuring and investment. And, you know, we could sit here and forecast based on what we have, but if you want to make real change in the future, you have to basically set up institutional structures for decision making, provide financial capability to implement new projects. And I would suggest one, of, I'm just curious, is, is one of those new projects that someone's thinking about taking that idea that we looked at 30, 40 years ago, actually we wanted to move the runways into the ocean so we'd have removed the, the noise problem. I don't think that's possible anymore. Does anybody know the status of plans to use that inherent capability that we have? It's only 20 feet deep or so off of, off of uh, Long Beach, uh, Long Island. Okay, if we don't, then maybe that's something we should look at. It w might be a way to solve uh, the dredge disposal issue and, uh, and maybe create an island uh, for creating energy. As uh, 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 Mr. Yara suggested, you know, in other countries, uh, filling in the water isn't necessarily something you can't think about. And this wouldn't be that big an island. Thank you. Um, 